Um, so I'm still Mel Hauser, Executive Director of All Brains Belong, and this is Brain Club. So um, I also want to tell everyone, most of you know this who are here on Zoom with us now, but for those watching asynchronously, um, and, and, and those of you who are here who, who are not yet aware of this, on Saturday, we have a very cool event happening um, that is part Statehouse Lawn, part hybrid Statehouse Lawn and Zoom. So it's a community health and education fair where not only do we have um, our customized COVID vaccination clinic for babies, kids, and adults, but we have um, some awesome community partners tabling about, about various resources. We have um, health education presentations about COVID safety and family youth mental health, long COVID, all kinds of topics that, and I, I think are gonna be um, uh, really, really good conversations. Um, and that those educational parts are, you can, you can sign up if you wanted to come via Zoom, um, just go to allbrainsbelong.org forward slash protect dash kids. Um, and if you're around in Montpelier, we'd love to see you on the Statehouse lawn. As always, you can participate however works for you. Um, if you. If your captions are not popping up and you would like them, um, click on the live, the live transcript. Or if that's not popping up in your version of Zoom, the more dot, 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 and click show subtitles. And then if they are popping up automatically and you want to turn them off, do the same pathway to click hide subtitles. All right. So, I'm going to tell a little bit of story. Um, many of you have heard this story uh, before, but I think just kind of frames our conversation about unlearning some of our expert expectations and things that we've been told, not just before we became parents, but like while we're doing it, right? So there I am on the left six weeks before I gave birth to Luna. Um, and actually, I mean, like, I think just a week before I gave birth to Luna. And then there's Luna, who made it really clear to me that I didn't know what I was doing and that anything I had been told about how this was supposed to go, even as a doctor who takes care of babies, um, no, that's not how that went, like, at all. Um, and the thing is, it's because of what I had been told and what I was telling myself that contributed so much to the stresses that I experienced as a new parent. And um, I say that because really now, now I know um, that there's no right way to be a baby. There's no right way to be a parent. There's no right way to, to be a human, right? And so yet there are these defaults. And so all month we've been talking about the defaults of healthcare, the defaults of education, the defaults of employment, like there are defaults of parenting, there totally are. And so that's what I'm hoping we can unpack a little bit tonight. So um, I decided since we had the, uh, the luxury of, of, of a slideshow, um, since, so, so, so while we've been talking about brain rules, I never like went back and did the original, what are we even talking about? Like still four weeks in, what do you even, what do you mean when you make up these terms? Cause they are in fact made up terms. Um, so brain rules, the things we grew up with, our assumptions, the expectations, the things people tell us, the things they, that we tell ourselves as opposed to world rules, like laws of physics, like um, universally generalizable humankind statements, like don't hit people in the head if they don't like it. It's a world rule. But there, and there are world rules of parenting, sure there are, but there are a lot of brain rules. And that impacts our expectations of ourself and our expectations of other people, expectations of our kids, expectations of our partners, expectations of our coworkers, like expectations of, of, of just like general society. And um, sometimes that impact is not very good or not very helpful. And when, and, 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 and some other examples, like um, we have to sit down together as a family at the dinner table. It's actually, in fact, a brain rule because, in fact, you can be a family without being at the dinner table. 
In fact, you could actually eat dinner, not even at a table. Whoa. Um, my house has to be clean when people come over. Like lots of people say that stuff or think that stuff, but it is a brain rule. Someone made it up as opposed to a true world rule. I have value as a human being. I need to provide my brain and body with nourishment. The dopamine bound brain needs dopamine. These are like true world rules. So we make brain rules for regulation. We make brain rules um, that's upstairs brain, making downstairs brain feel safe. I, I always love this, this uh, construct from Dr. Dan Siegel and Dr. Tina Payne Bryson of upstairs brain and downstairs brain. So your cortex, and your limbic system. And we spend a lot of time at Brain Club talking about what a dysregulated limbic system can look like. But brain rules are a way of trying to regulate your upstairs brain trying to make the world make sense, trying to assert or establish autonomy or control, make that world predictable, um, less chaotic. Um, so I might say to Luna, um, you're eating uh, red, juicy, melty cherries. Um, you have to eat that in the kitchen and not on the white rug. Yeah, that's upstairs brain trying to reduce chaos. That does not make it a world rule. And of course, avoiding trauma or traumatic memories. So um, I, have, I have been on this journey. I know a lot of people have been on this journey since we've been doing it together about like checking your brain rules. Is this a brain rule or a world rule? And just because it's a brain rule doesn't mean you have to do, you know, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just doesn't have to be rational. Brain rules are supposed to help you. And if they help you, keep them. Otherwise, consider making a new brain rule. And so um, I'm going to introduce, before I introduce our panel, I'm going to play a little video clip from, actually, how do I do this? I have to click share sound. There we go. Um, a little clip from Brain Club from February where Hannah Bloom talked about the myths of attachment and attunement. And here we go. Then I'll introduce our panelists. Hi, baby. Oh, so sweet. Okay. So this was the like the story the books are gonna tell you when you're looking at attunement and attachment that it happens, it's blissful, you get there, it's going to be this place and um, read these books and, and learn these things and then have a child in your arms and this happens. Um, and yes, we will have all of these days, we'll have those moments of picture of a mother and baby um, snuggling chest to chest with white shirts on, um, serene smiles and snuggly baby. Um, picture of a mother and a child on their back, um, giggling in the ear and smiling. The photo of two individuals walking hand in hand, uh, appear to be an elderly couple. Um, and then a photo of a, um, appears to be a mother and a daughter, teenage years, um, rocking out and mom having um, a hard time understanding what's going on with this world. Um, so even within an hour, we have all of these emotions and we have all of these sensory systems and we have all of these regulations and we know that it's going to happen over and over that cycle and then in a lifetime attunement and attachment is a lifelong lifelong process there you go and with that i will introduce our panel um, uh, we, we were joined by three panelists today. We're going to talk about their process of thinking about this unlearning process and what that's been like. And then I'm hoping that most of our conversation today will be interactive. 
where we can do this together. So maybe if you can wave when I'm introducing you, maybe if you feel like it. So we're joined by Linda Riddle, who is a mom of two, an occupational therapist, and an atypical human. Um, I, I love your introduction, Linda. I think it's like amazing, except when you deliver it, like the way you deliver it is like just more, more it's, it's better than, it, it's better when you say it. Okay. Anyway, um, um, uh, Natalie Manhouse, who is a pediatric occupational therapist also, who I uh, also identifies as neurodivergent and is a mother of two boys, age three and five. And Laura Lewis, mom of three, um, who is a nurse researcher focusing on quality of life and social relationships for autistic adults. So um, I don't, do, do, you, do you have an, an order that, that you'd like to, to speak in? Okay, Linda, you wanna go first? Okay. Um, I, uh, I believed the propaganda. I thought if I was capable enough and confident enough and dedicated enough and strong enough and persistent enough and stubborn enough, you know, I could, uh, they, everything would align and life would be beautiful with the little people at the dinner table and, you know, smock dresses and braid their hair like Laura Ingalls. Okay. I bought it. I bought the whole thing. And uh, the people that God sent me wanted nothing to do with that illusion. And I had to realize a great deal that I had assumed and I had projected was not at all based in the reality of my people. Um, to, to the point that sometimes I think the point of them was to teach me that I don't know anything. <laughs> um, but I am very happy with the people I got. They're wonderful people. And I'm glad that they're in my life. And the things that they have taught me have been incredible. Uh, and there have been, there were parenting moments where I knew I was right, that I just, I was in touch with my kid and I knew what was going to work and I knew what was true. And it didn't matter that nobody else believed me because it was still true and it was right. And I, when I advocated for my children in those moments, I was being a good parent. When I was advocating for what I thought was true and right instead of what they thought was true and right are the times that it always came back to bite me. I guess if I could give myself one piece of advice, I would go back and I would say the only thing that you actually have any control over at all is what you value. Make sure you value the good points. So. Oh, thank you. There's so much to unpack there, like so much resonance. Natalie? Yeah, so um, I agree with everything, you know, Linda said. Of course, and I think that one of the things is when you are going down this journey and you realize that you have a child who is possibly neurodivergent and it's not following the same path that you had been told that you had seen, then you get to a place where you're like, okay, well, what, what do I do? And sometimes in the stories, and Linda, you didn't do this, but sometimes in stories when you hear parents, they're like, well, I had to let go of expectations. And so it seems like, okay, well, I'll just like let go of the expectations. But it's, it's like these little mic, it's like, like, um, I'm trying to think of oh, onion, sorry. <laughs> like, what's that vegetable with the purple? Thing? Okay, so an onion, so you have all these layers. So you do like 
one layer where at first it's like, okay, like kind of going back to Mel's example, like we don't have to sit at the table. Like that's okay. Like we can get up and move around. And then it's like, all right, well, what's the next thing that's not working for me and my child? And then it's like, all right, well, then I'll address that. So it never is like, okay, I'm just going to not do something. And as you start to kind of unfold what's going to work for you, because it has to work for you as a parent and then also for your child, there's like people in my life. So my husband is more traditional, um, like a more behaviorist point of view from parenting based on how he was raised, right? Like I come with my own stuff, like our, my brain rules, my conditioning is such like the same thing as a lot of us, I grew up in the eighties are. And then at, at, at some point I have to kind of confront him and be like, this is what I read. This is what I'm seeing. And this is why. And that's not to say that he agreed with me or that he even heard it. And same with my parents. So I had to have multiple, multiple conversations of little pieces that I felt like were working and not working. And like, you actually can't discipline my child because he will literally freak out and hate you for the next week. And so it looks the way that I have to parent looks totally different than how I was parented, than how everybody in my circle of people who see him almost every day parented. And so that's sort of can be the daunting task. But I think what was really helpful is look at, okay, like what's the thing that's not working? And then I'll address that. What's the thing that's not working? And then when they see it, when they start to see it, then it's able, you're able to kind of explain it better. And in the meantime, it's a lot of like, I'm doing this. Like, I think this is right. And you have to just trust me. I know it didn't look like how you raised me. I know it doesn't look like it's typical, but this is sort of what is working. And so we're going to go with it. I ended up just a little backstory too. We ended up pulling my son out of this preschool program in November of last year and homeschooled him. And again, we come from a very like school oriented parents, grandparents, like, like literally it was like everybody's mind was just like blown. And now that they see it, like I was able to get more buy-in from my husband when he's like, oh yeah, our child's not melting down for like two or three hour, hours a day, like every single day, like, oh yeah, like he seems to be happier. Once you get that evidence, then it's a little bit easier, not only to see, okay, there's like the next thing that's not working for us. There's the next thing, but it's also easier to naturally advocate because you have the evidence there. But in the beginning, it's like, you're like, well, all right, I'll let go of expectations, but it is just like, okay, what's not working? And then I think that was really helpful for me. It's sort of a long-winded way of saying that. And, and, and the, the evidence is that you like, so, like, like the brain rule wasn't working anymore. So like it made it easier to kind of recognize it as a brain rule. Um, and, 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 and that framework um, can be applied to so many things. What's actually even more interesting and adds another layer to this is that I'm a pediatric occupational therapist. And then I did this deep dive into neurology, maybe like eight years ago. And then I learned everything there was to learn about neurology from an occupational therapist standpoint, and then applied those principles to supporting children who were dysregulated or had trouble regulating. And it was a very successful minus like kind of a handful of kids. Then my child comes along and literally nothing I know or do works. That's not even including the fact that I look at my child or my children, and like nothing comes into my head, like nothing clinical. There's no ideas. He's just like a person that I don't understand. And so then not only did I have my parenting brain rules and just like me brain rules, and then it was like, okay, well, I thought I was this amazing occupational therapist and I can't do anything with my child. And so it was like, I had to break all of those too, which is really interesting. I had that very similar experience and many, many clinicians do um, because I should know how to fix this when there's not something to fix. Um, I should know what to do. Like no human should know what to do in all instances. So like the, I should know what to do is a brain rule and it's not a helpful brain rule for like a lot of people in a lot of different situations. Thank you for sharing. Laura. I have so many thoughts on this and Linda and Natalie, that was like, like nodding along profusely when you're talking. Um, I have like a random list of things that came to mind when I was thinking about my own brain rules and unlearning. Um, Linda, you said, you know, we, knowing it's right and true, even if others didn't and they didn't listen or feel that. I think one of the things I've struggled with is 
not parenting for other people besides myself and my children and my family. Like so often I found early on, if I was with my parents, I would discipline my kids very differently. I would treat them differently. I'd respond to them differently than when we were alone in our house. And it led to more chaos. It led to my kids feeling like I was an unpredictable parent because depending on the audience, I would change what I was, what I, I was doing. And it took a lot of, I think just time and confidence to stop caring what other people think of my parenting and just doing what works for myself and for my family. Um, so that was one thing. And along with that, there, that idea that there's like one right way to do it. Um, my husband's line that he says to me all the time is there's more than one way to load a dishwasher. And <clears throat> basically the idea being like, we're getting the job done and that's our way and it works. And like, and, and that goes, he uses that line with me a lot when we parent differently that like, you know, we're both, we both love our kids. We both have their best interests in mind. We stay on the same page. We communicate about everything, but in the moment we do it a little differently and that that's okay. We don't, we can be on the same page, excuse me. <clears throat> we can be on the same page and still respond to the situation a little bit differently. Um, I also find that whole idea of there's more than one right way to do it. I, I can be judgy of other parents and I can worry about other parents judging me. And what I found, I was just reading a, um, Brene Brown book and reflecting on the idea that when I'm judgy, that usually means it's an area where I'm a little vulnerable and I'm feeling a little insecure about my own parenting. And so kind of taking that stop and reflecting and stop worrying about what other people are doing and really focus on like, why am I feeling insecure about that decision in my own life? Um, and one of the things I found really interesting in, in the book I was reading, um, she says, it, the question isn't so much, are you parenting the right way as it is, are you the adult that you want your child to grow up to be? And I thought that was a great quote, but it's really funny. I'm sitting here and I'm reading it again and thinking that that sort of implies that my kids should grow up to be like me. And that really doesn't reflect who they need to be either. And I think that's its own brain rule of like, they should be me and they should I can model to them and they will be that. And I think a huge thing for me is learning to love and admire their strengths for who they are, even if those aren't the strengths I expected or in, dreamt of in my head when I thought about being a parent. Linda, you mentioned like that, you know, the braid and that like my kid's hair is everywhere. My daughter chipped her tooth when she was really little and every picture of her entire childhood, she's got this like half a front tooth missing. And it, to me, epitomizes like, I had this dream of like girls with curls and bows and like, no, it's none of that. And it's perfect the way it is, but like, it's not that vision and, and that being okay. And like Mel was saying that idea of, I should know how to fix this, like stop fixing and just love them. And that makes it a lot better. Um, along with that, one major brain rule for me is that People pleasing was a great quality that I wanted my children to have. I love people pleasing. I'm a people pleaser. My child people pleases to a dangerous degree. And for me now, it's how do I teach a child self-advocacy and selfishness almost that like you don't have to give away everything you have to be kind. That's not the same thing. And it's it's been a funny flip of the script for me that we are always so focused on sharing and kindness. And my daughter will come home and say, you know, somebody wanted this, so I gave them all of mine. And I'm like, well, then you couldn't play. And she's like, but it made them happy. Well, like that's, I feel like I'm struggling sometimes still with how to like, you know, celebrate that she's sharing, but also teach her that skill of like, you don't have to give everything, of, you don't have to empty the whole cup, like, you know, keep some in there. That's an important skill. Um, and then I think the last kind of point is that it's, really okay to be overwhelmed and tired and to not love every moment of parenting and that that doesn't mean I don't love my kids and it doesn't mean I'm not a good parent um and that it's okay to make mistakes and I think a major one for me there is that it's okay to share with my children when I've made a mistake I was raised with that mentality that when you make a mistake like does the parent is always right that's it and we're raising our kids much more like hey, I yelled at you earlier and I shouldn't have. And here's what I was feeling. And that's the way I responded. And that's not a good way to respond. Here were some other things I could have done different, differently. And we're finding that that works a lot better in our house for actually modeling like humanness instead of that idea that we're always right and you always listen. I mean, they sh there was that balance between safety and wanting them to listen when they need to, but also like that we're not just these like beings that know everything. So those, that was my long-winded list of things I thought of.
Thank you. Thank you. There's, I mean, there's, 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 there's so much there. Right. And so just like in, 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 for all three of you, I really appreciate you modeling for all of us, right. That this, it is a world rule that this is really hard. Right. And like, when people make it look like it's not hard, like that's one, not helpful, two, maybe based on some brain rules and just unlearning the whole thing of saying, what, what, what do I do? How do I exist in this relationship, in, in any relationship, but um, uh, to establish safety? and co-regulation, because that's the world rule. Um, and, and what I thought I would do, just so that we have multiple different ways of engagement, um, I made us a jam board. And I was thinking, um, let me see if this works. Oh, good, okay. So as we have our conversation today, um, in addition to just unmuting and shouting it out or typing in the chat box, if you wanted to, um, you could click the link in the chat. It will bring you to this screen. And then over on the left underneath the arrow is a sticky note. And you can say, bedtime. Um, um, child needs to sleep alone or whatever it is that the brain rule is you can make sticky notes and i bet that we hi nina thanks for coming no i um i totally i you uh, i was i was i was expecting that football practice would take over your lives so thank thank you for being here um so anyway i would love to know how this this topic is impacting any of you um, and, and, and again, feel free, feel free to participate however, however works for you. I had a kind of mentoring moment I'd like to share. Um, with my youngest, um, and it falls under that, you know, you have to look right in public sort of thing. And your, your child and your family has to conform to, to you know. so when she was a very, very little person. We were working on using both her hands because while she has great fine motor skills, she didn't have good bilateral skills. And my dad was visiting. And as a break for me, he took um, Emma around in the cart and I hear this God awful, horrible noise in Walmart. And I'm like, oh my God, I, you know, what is that? Somebody needs to control their kid. And wherever I go in Walmart, there's this like honking and I'm with my other kid and, you know, it's about time to meet up and the honking is all over the store, this honking, it's hideous. And there's my dad and my youngest, and he has gotten her this old fashioned duck call that he found somewhere in the sporting department where you have to do this with it to make the, the duck call noise. <laughs> And for the last half hour, she's been going around Walmart making the duck call noise as loud as she can because she's never been a weak child. It is like honk, 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 honk all over the store. And I'm like, and I look at him and I'm like, what are you doing? You know, how many people are hating us? And he's like, she's using both her hands. And I'm like, well, hey, okay. <laughs> She's using both her hands. She's been using both her hands for half an hour. She's using them purposely. It's coordinated. We're going to buy the duck call. I'm shutting up now, you know? <laughs> Emma was fine annoying people in Walmart because apparently that's what we needed to do to get her to use her two hands together. There's no right way to grow your skills.
Um, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm commenting on one of the stickies in the Jamboard about shoes required to be in stores. Um, so uh, Luna, um, Luna, Luna asserts her autonomy in many ways throughout the hour. Um, uh, but one of which the theme of I do not wear shoes um, is, is, a, is, is a common one. And so um, we were going to go get a treat like Luna shoes. They're required for the going in the bakery. She's like, no brain rule. I was like, it may in fact be a brain rule, but it's not my brain rule. It's the bakery's brain rule. And I don't get to control other people's brain rules. That brain rule makes their world make sense and makes it safe and orderly in their place of business. So they can have their brain rules and you can choose whether or not you get a chocolate chip cookie. We don't have to go in there, but like, if you wanna go in there, you gotta wear shoes. She's like, fine. So I think that it's healthy for kids to know that everyone makes brain rules, including them, um, and that it, it, it doesn't mean they're bad. Um, we've talked a lot about brain rules that are bad, um, but like there are some brain rules that are good um, or helpful in that situation. And when they're no longer helpful, you give them up. Well, there's some good ones here. I'm wondering um, what other what other um, experiences have you had with unlearning how how other people tell you you have to do it that like you know in your soul is not how you have to do it. I'm gonna read some of these out. Um, there's such good ones here. I'm trying to like move things around so we can see them and see each other. Yeah, oh yes. Kids have to say hi or engage with other adults or children when, when, when meeting them. Have to say please and thank you. Have to eat what everyone else is eating at a meal. There are so many brain rules around food and eating that result in such problems. Um, yes. Laura. Yeah, I'm just thinking of your question about dealing with other people and their brain, unlearning the brain rules. And I, my thought on it is just, I, I found it really painful to unlearn the brain rules, honestly. Like it's liberating in the long run, but it's painful in the process. I think I've had to let go of a lot of like what people think of me. And I'm somebody who cares very much about what people think of me. Um, and that's been a, a really difficult process for me. And, and even recognizing like the difference between a brain rule and a world rule, like dicing that out and trying to separate like things I've grown up, you know, believing in and, and hearing about and the way I was raised, I, those are really deep rooted ideas. And they can feel so deeply rooted sometimes that they feel like world rules, even when they're not. And that's been a real learning experience for me and it, ongoing. I feel like that'll be a lifelong process of sorting those out. And that's the thing about a brain rule. A real brain rule is the one that feels like a world rule. It's so hard because especially ones that you were taught or yourself made up as a young person because they get you know, over rehearsed and those neural pathways strengthened for decades. Um, and a lot of times, when we are stressed and dysregulated ourselves, we go right back to them. Um, like for me, I have a brain rule that it is optimal to be calm and that to be a good parent, like a comforting good parent, that means that I am calm. And so when I am not calm and I judge myself and like think about Brene Brown and the shame factor, because I violated a brain rule of my own. Those are the ones that hurt the most. Sarah's got in the chat because you not only have to go against mainstream culture, 
Um, but many of us have had to face outright criticism and that is so hard as a people pleaser. Yes, and a lot of us experience um, rejection sensitive dysphoria where that criticism is like a limbic assault. It feels literally unsafe to be criticized. And it's not like being dramatic. It's like you don't get to pick what sets off your limbic system. Um, and criticism for a lot of people does just that. Um, Laura says, it's people pleasing for myself to the extreme and that I honestly just want people to like my kids. Um, and it can be extremely hard to accept that doing the best slash right thing for my kids sometimes means that people won't like them and that's okay. And Nita agrees. I think one thing that was really helpful for me is, is knowing that, um, you know, when you look at any given situation, if I started asking myself, like, why? And there's a, and my kids are always asking, like, especially the one that's neurodivergent, well, why? I'm, and I, I swear to God, like 90% of the time, like, I don't know why, you know, and it's, and it's going back to that maybe with our parents, uh, they would say, well, because I told you so, well, that doesn't apply to my child. Like, it, that does not work. So I've had to rethink every single thing that I do. And if I don't have a good solution or like a true solution, something that makes like literal sense, then I'm like, well, I guess we can do it because it's just one of those things that I was implicitly following without perhaps thinking about it. And I think that's how a lot of us were taught before we became parents, just like follow what you're told, like do this, like, and not question it. Right, but you've got, if you have a child who's constantly questioning and not able to listen to these directions that do not perhaps make sense, then it requires you to think about them really like analytically and then come up with something. And um, those who question the status quo are those who change the world, and we can't have it both ways, right? And so if everyone followed the brain rules of that's the way it is and just do the thing like nothing would ever get better but in the moment it's like so hard to think about that because it violates a brain rule and then if you think about how um I know my son and I and I have come a long way he's 14 now and I certainly we certainly have I certainly have a lot more brain rules to work on but one good thing I can say is that one thing I've you know I've been teaching him for, for quite a few years is we say, you know, when we're thinking about what other people think, we say, well, we're leaders. And I give him an example of people that are great leaders in the world and what they do and how they stand out. And even when it comes to things that used to be brain rules for me, like you must wear matching socks or things like that. Um, like he wants to get step outside of that. And like last year, all year he wanted to wear like these just really wild, crazy un unmatching socks. And um, he was like really popular in school because of that. And I said, even if it was, it went the other direction, you still got to be strong and we still have to be leaders, right? Because everything you do may not go that way. Same, like one other example is that, um, <clears throat> like he has these hyperfixations that like they just go on these phases. He has to keep doing the same things. He doesn't know why. Like uh, all last year in school, he was doing the Spider-Man three dance. And um, <laughs> like, I just said, as long as you're not doing, you know, like during class, if it breaks or other times and that's fine, you know, whatever, if you have to do it. And that's another thing where he got really popular and people were requesting it, you know what I mean? Just being himself. But again, I said, if it doesn't go that way, then, you know, you know, whatever, you know, it's just, uh, you still gotta be, you still gotta be strong. You're still a leader, right? You don't care about what people think. So it's something that's kind of taken some time, but we've gotten to the point, it's like, for at least a lot of things, uh, we just don't care. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I like to tell Luna that it's a world rule that you can't infringe upon someone else's access needs. So if you need to make noise or you need to do this dance or you need to throw a whatever, that's fine, That you can, you can do that, it's your access need. But it is a world rule that you cannot infringe upon someone else's access need. So you can't like, if I if my access need is to communicate to someone else, like you can't infringe upon that. You can't, um, you know, like you can't hit someone else. You can't violate their consent. You can't like so so that's those, that's world rule stuff while still 
affording autonomy and access. There's a lot just like themes of stuff that's in the Jamboard, a lot of things about conforming to social standards, including politeness. Um, and uh, Lord, uh, Natalie says in the chat, um, it's like when my son needs to crash into things, he will often go to his brother and tackle him. So it's a lot of redirecting and explaining that humans are not for hurting. You can crash over here. Yeah, you can, you can crash, but not into him because he did not give consent for that. Um, and uh, Laura says, super wise to teach um, that, that, that listening would be good, even, um, e oh, even when it does not go well, that it's still about being a leader. Sorry, I read them out of order. We're chronologically connected. Um, I'm wondering if, when you all first started to think about like the process of questioning, like the things that you believed about how parenting was supposed to go. And when you like, like, what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean? This is how it's supposed to go. Like, how did that process go when it first began? Um, Cause I think like we, um, there's lots of people who it's hard to even begin the journey of unlearning. Cause you don't recognize that it has to begin because you don't recognize it's a problem until you've at least done a little bit of unlearning. You continue to, we as humans, when people violate our own brain rules, um, it's really hard to be open to that. Laura says, my kids have forced me to self-reflect. How did, how, how, how did I, that, how'd they do that? I, I feel like they, it's, uh, was it Natalie saying your kids are questioning everything? I have a daughter that questions everything. And I feel like the more I'm questioned, it's exactly the example that you said. It's like having to give an answer or, or not. I mean, my parents wouldn't have engaged in that. It just would have been because I said so. And that would have been the end of it. And I, I kind of had in my head that I wanted to give an answer. I didn't want to just be a, because I said so. And that was like a little brain roll that I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go out on my own and do it this way. And lo and behold, that was like the start of this whole opening of the floodgates to say, letting them question really forced me to think about why I was doing what I was doing. And, and, and I think it has taken a lot for me to, when, when it doesn't make sense to like, let it go and even say that her like, well, I don't know. I don't know why we do it that way. That's, let me think it through and like talk out loud with her. And I have a kid that helps connect the dots a lot and she'll even bring new lot. Is it like this mom? And I'm like, well, no, but now that you say that, that's a really, like, she makes me think in different ways that, that make me learn about parenting, I think. I think something else um, that was helpful too is from the very beginning, and I think this is true for a lot of parents, it was very obvious that my child was different in like a lot, a lot of ways from what I expected parenting to be. And so it was already very hard, you know, for me. And so from that journey, it's like, okay, well, I need some help in this area. So it's just like researching, starting one thing. And then as he got older, it was more like you said, like more self-reflection. So it was a lot of, when you have a child who's questioning you, it makes it very easy to self-reflect. But if you don't have that, it's a lot of like, what do I believe? Even like going to the core of like, who am I and what do I like to do? Instead of just being told. And so as basic as that sounds, I, I think a lot of us grew up not being able to have that. Like we didn't have that kind of like autonomy and reflection and really knowing ourselves and being able to understand like who we are and what we want and how then how we want to parent. And so you get into this parenting role and you're like, well, I guess I have to tell everybody what to do now because that's what happened to me. And I think a lot of times when we have a neuro neurodivergent child, it's, it doesn't start off like that, you know? So I think that it's, again, like kind of piece by piece as they come up, it's like my child brings me stuff. Like now I don't even have to go looking. It's like, whatever the next thing is, like he will confront me on it. And then I know it's something that I have to kind of like relearn, right? Yes. Oh, I, that, I, I, that so resonates with me. Um, Nita shares, we didn't get questions. We just got very puzzling behaviors and lashing out. For me, finding 
the PDA label and reading about other parents' experiences and what they found worked helped open my mind dramatically. Yeah, and I think that um, I, was, I, was, I was describing uh, to someone earlier today about how um, my child to me represents what like unfettered autonomy looks like and unfettered um, self-advocacy. Like she communicates her access needs often in like really big ways. And this is, this is an admirable quality and it's hard. It's all of that. And so it is often, um, just to, to Nita's point, it is often the lashing out and, you know, thing, behaviors, things we can observe that communicate someone's underlying physiologic state. And so how many times have I, as a child or as an adult, wondered about someone's underlying physiologic state and that person is unable to communicate that. So here we are, we have a nervous system of a sweet little one who is communicating something really important toward our pursuit of the world rule of creating a safe co-regulation relationship. And that's all like easy to say, like from upstairs brain, upstairs brain can say that all day in the moment. Downstairs brain has no clue. Downstairs brain just feels like your brain rules are being violated and it feels unsafe, which energetically puts out and en like energetic signals into the world that make a child potentially feel unsafe. Even if you say nothing, they feel it. Um, Natalie shares, um, a few years ago, I had never considered a PDA diagnosis for my child, but as I learned and unlearned more, it was like the diagnosis finally made sense and much of it was about going through my own rules. For example, if I follow a brain rule that my child needs to listen to me, I will have trouble adapting to their needs that fall outside of that brain rule and thus I won't be as open to adapting and relearning. And Laura adds, I think we were also pushed to question brain rules when we reached the point that parenting was just not going well for our family. We're okay with chaos, but it felt wrong. Um, and for me, for my partner, for my daughter, giving clear signals that we were not meeting her needs. Absolutely. I, I had this, you know, I, I, I continued to have um, that, that experience of like, well, something has to change because needs are not being met. It's like what Natalie said before. Um, how have folks navigated balancing kind of the culture in your own homes versus um, knowing that there are brain rules outside your home that your child has to interface with. That's something that comes up a lot. I try to be very honest and explain what the, the societal expectation is when I understand it and where it came from when I'm able to figure it out. And sometimes we just have to default to neurotypicals are weird. <laughs> they get to be them, you get to be you, we all coexist. Some, some brains do it one way, some brains do it another way. Neither one of them is wrong, as long as world rules are respected, right? Like of not, violating access needs, not violating consent. But um, I want Luna to be able to predict um, what's gonna happen because she has a kind of brain for which it feels unsafe when things are unexpected. Like if I predict that, you know, this is the system I've created and then at life outside my home, there's like this outcome that is not expected, that's gonna feel, un that's gonna feel unsafe. So. Some, some, some characters in the world may respond this way. Some characters respond this other way. So all of that is expected. I think a lot of it too is, is being able to say, um, like my, so this is an example with eating, right? Cause my son's a very picky eater. And so I'll say like, my job as a parent is to make sure that you're getting healthy food. I can't make you eat it 
but I have to put it in front of you and I will support you however you want. If you want to taste it, whatever it is, if you want to just look at it, that's fine. But it is my job to make sure that you have healthy food available to you. And so that um, is much different than me saying you have to eat everything on your plate, which literally will not happen and it will end up bad for everybody. And so it's, it's kind of figuring out kind of how to go around things and explain like, what's my role? And then just a lot of like check-ins, like, does this make sense to you? Like, does it make sense that when you jump on him? Cause sometimes I feel like it doesn't make sense. Like something that I take for granted, like when you jump on someone or wrestle someone, like going back to the other example, like that will hurt their body. I feel like there's this disconnect where he will jump because it feels fine in his body, but he doesn't relate it to their body. So part of it is like, I feel like almost pointing out those very obvious to me rules, like those world, world, world rules that he doesn't implicitly understand. Like when you jump on someone that could hurt their body and it would feel like if someone jumped on you, that would hurt your body. So there's a lot of kind of like that where you don't think you maybe need to take a step back, but it's super helpful when you just assume that they're not assuming anything or that they just don't know. Yeah. And, and, in in that example, um, it, it may not even be about the, how it would feel in your body. It might be about, did you ask permission before you made contact with another person's body? No, you did not. Um, and I mean, uh, if, 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 if permission was asked and permission was granted to jump, like that's a different conversation. <laughs> um, but but that, 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 that first step probably, probably got skipped too. And that goes the, the other way around too. Like I, when I think about even myself where I like impulsively reach out to like fluff my child's hair um, or like offer her a hug, like, I definitely don't always remember to ask consent to fluff her hair. Um, and so like, I'm trying to relearn, like I'm trying to practice like adherence to that world rule. Cause that is in fact a world rule that I want her to know about, about asking consent before making contact with another human and entering their body bubble. That's how we talk about it. Ma. Mel, that also reminds me of something I've learned from this group is I've noticed how often I like gaslight my kids without meaning to like the number of times they'll tell me like, it's too loud in here and I don't perceive it to be loud. And my gut response is no, it's not like, how horrible is that? Like, I'm just dismissing what they're telling me. And that's something that I didn't even recognize I did until I heard people here talking about that. And then was like, oh my gosh, I totally do that to them that it's, I, it's such a small thing for me that I didn't even realize I was doing it. And I feel like one thing I've been trying to do in terms of reconciling the different environments where they have to be, um, my son lately was telling me that school was too loud. And so I'm, I talked to the teachers about it and we said, you know, he's, it's very loud for him at school. Would it be okay for him to wear a pair of headphones to have in the classroom if he finds it to be too loud? He never even uses them, but he felt a lot better about, he didn't want to go to school anymore because he kept telling me it's too loud there. And now we haven't had any issues since we got him the headphones and his teachers say he never even wears them, but just having that tool has made a huge difference. Awesome. Cause you know, the agency of being able to do something, you know, you'll feel like the, the safety comes from just knowing that there's something you can be able to do. Um, and I think that like, that's not, uh, I wouldn't give yourself such a hard time. I know that lots, uh, yes, people at Brain Club often give that example of like this, um, the invalidation of sensory experiences um, growing up in the world. Um, uh, those, many of those situations um, relate to people who um, are not, not as self-reflective as you to be able to say, oh, that's happening. I'm doing that. Like, so it, like, um, I would venture to guess that that's not the only thing that, that occurred in those relationships. Like, I really hope not. I, that's not how I perceive myself as a parent, but it's, it is funny. I feel like sometimes it's those little things where we respond without thinking that then we look at and say like, what message am I sending by this behavior or this reaction? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, a lot of it is habitual, right? Like if we, 
um, grew up in environments or have been around in environments where there's like the reflexive responses of like, you're okay. That is what comes out, even if that's not the message that we intend to be sending. Yeah, that's another one is, uh, is, the, is the you're okay. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's um, yeah, they fall and my gut is to say you're okay. Cause, but it's coming from a place of wanting to reassure as soon as you flip the lens of saying that is potentially invalidating, like then you're not gonna do it. Then you're gonna like be able to like, you know, pause, override, but that's like high level executive functioning stuff to be able to do that. Once you have the paradigm shift and your lens is different, then, then it's totally different but it's laying down those new pathways of what you do instead. I ask Luna, what do you want me to, because my instinct is to go hug. That is not what my sweet little love wants. So I say, what would you like me to do when you trip and fall? Nothing. Mm -hmm. So we have compromised that I will, um, I will come closer, but I will not look and I will not talk. And that's how we negotiate our access needs. Everything is negotiating access needs. That's a world rule. So with that, um, thank you so much to our panelists and thank you um, so much to everyone. Oh, oh, I wanna, yeah, um, that's a really good, I'm just noticing out of the corner of my eye, Laura adding that school teaches my kids to ask friends, is there anything I can do? Like if someone looks hurt, yeah, that's, that's, I like that. I like that. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, all of you again. And we hope to see you Saturday at, um, uh, at, at, at our community health and education fair. And then uh, next week's brain club, we will be talking about the brain rules of relationships. So it's going to be like a part two conversation from our July brain club. I really loved that brain club. So I, uh, I, I look forward to seeing you then. Bye.